This program is made possible by a grant from the National Endowment for the Arts, with additional funding from the Maryland Humanities Council. <laughs> Poet Roland Flint talks with Josephine Jacobson. Welcome to The Writing Life. Today we have the pleasure of spending some time with the splendid poet Josephine Jacobson, a poet whose first poem was published when she was 11 years old and whose recent collection of poems, just out in fact in the crevice of time, has 18 poems in it that were written between 1935 and 1950. So we're talking about a long and increasingly illustrious career, which includes a stint as the consultant in poetry to the Library of Congress, which is now more aptly designated uh, by position as the, the uh, poet laureate of the nation. Uh, Josephine is going to read some poems, and we have a chance to talk with her today. She was also cited last year in 1994 by the Academy uh, let me get it right. The American Academy, American Arts, Academy Arts. of Arts. And in the citation, the, uh, it is declared that her best work has been done in her 70s and 80s, which reminds us of Berryman's saying of Williams that he had the mysterious late excellence, which is the crown of all our trials. And uh, a nice marvelous thing, thing and I think uh, uh, absolutely true of Josephine Jacobson's work. So welcome, Josephine. Thank you. It's nice to see you again. Wonderful to see you again. And uh, I thought we would just begin by asking you to read something from this fine new book. It's called In the Crevice of Time. It's just out from Johns Hopkins Press. Beautiful book. Well, I thought uh, I would start out by reading a motel in Troy, New York, because actually uh, the incident in this poem took place right here in Columbia. But for obvious reasons, Troy was important, so that was changed, but I feel that it's very appropriate here. A motel in Troy, New York. A shadow falls on our cribbage. The motel window is a glass wall down to grass. A huge swan is looking in. Cumulus cloud body, thunder cloud dirty neck that hoists the painted face, coral and black, Inky eyes peer at our lives. It cannot clean its strong snake neck. It stands squat on its yellow webs, splayed to hold scarcely up the heavy feathered dazzle. All of us stare. Then in a lurch it turns and waddles, rocking, presses the stubble to the tip of the blue pond, sets sail in one pure motion and is received by distance. That crucial soiled snake neck, arched to a white high curve, received by distance, and the shadowy girl across the water. It's wonderful, as if you've, as if you've made up your own myth out of Well, you know, there's poem. so many leader poems that you're kind of uh, worried about another leader poem, but no, it I, just I, happened. I think, you, I think you do it wonderfully. Um, one of your critics says, and I agree, that you have a superb narrative gift, and it seems to be a reference to your poems, but uh, I know you've published three books of short stories as well, and uh, I, I believe you have a collection of them coming out. Is that so? Well, I think, I think next year there, there's something in the wind on that, yes. Uh, I love fiction, and I have found it a great, uh, well, not relaxation, because no work that you ever do in that way is a relaxation, but a great changeover and stimulus uh, from poetry. Uh, uh, they're quite different, and I enjoy very much the, uh, the challenges that are quite different from the po poetic challenges. So I enjoy writing fiction very much. Can you go back and forth from one to the other kind of genre? Well, yes. Uh, you know, Roland, really, uh, most of the work that I've done has been done at Yaddo or at McDowell, and uh, I get sort of 
so filled up and jammed with stuff I want to do that it's impossible to do at home that when I get there, it all sort of pours out. So when I've been there, I've worked always on both fiction and poetry. Uh -huh. um, and are you writing these days? And if so, are you writing poems or stories or both now? I am writing, Roland. I have a poem coming out today in the New Yorker. I'm still, I'm still tottering in there. Um, I haven't written a, po a short story in almost a year. I hope that doesn't mean there won't be any more. But I've been writing them both uh, all through my 80s. Uh, That's wonderful. Well, yes and no. Well, it is. I saw a poem, I think it was last summer, in the Atlantic that was yes. quite wonderful. Well, William Meredith said I was post cautious <laughs> and that was a that was a cheering post remark. Post cautious. <laughs> That's wonderful. Well, our our main business today is to hear some of these wonderful poems. We don't have time for stories, but uh, it's also true that Josephine Jacobson has written distinguished books of criticism with with William Muller, one on UNESCO and one on Beckett. But today we're uh, concerned with this new book and uh, the opportunity to hear. Josephine Jacobson read from it. So, Josephine, if you... Well, I suppose this would really be rolled almost a little story in itself, um, a true story. I remember Flannery O'Connor saying that we are all, in a sense, displaced persons, and I think that's so true. Uh, this occurred at the Hopkins Hospital, but it wouldn't have made any difference where it occurred. It's called Mr. Mahoney. Illicitly, Mr. Mahoney roams. They have him in a room but it is not his. Though he has become confused, it is not in this. Mr. Mahoney cannot find his room. A young blonde nurse gentles him by the elbow. I hear her again in the hall. Mr. Mahoney, this isn't your room. Let's go back and see if you've brushed your teeth. Yours is eight to o. Why brushing his teeth is the lure, I cannot say. Does he prize it so? She darts on white feet to spear him from strange doors. I hear her repeat with an angel's patience, yours is down this way. But 820 is a swamp, a blasted heath. A dozen times returned, he knows it is wrong. There is a room in which he does belong. He has been to 820. He has brushed his teeth. Before his biopsy, the Harrod nurses attest Mr. Mahoney was tractable in a 2 though very old and brown. He will have to go. This is not the hall, not the building for his quest. Tranquilized, Mr. Mahoney still eludes. At 2 a.m. in my dark 283, the wide door cracks, and sudden and silently, Mr. Mahoney's nutty face obtrudes. It is gently snatched back by someone behind it, this is someone else's room. Yours is this way, Mr. Mahoney. He could not possibly stay. He's gone by noon. He did not have time to find it. It's wonderful. People are displaced in so many ways and uh, lose their identity so easily under, under various pressures. I remember a story of yours, Josephine, in which a woman who's about to leave town, and all her friends know she's leaving town, she just has time to catch a cab to the airport, I think it is, locks herself in the bathroom and can't get out. And uh, she you suffers. Know, I think that. everybody in America must have had that experience. I had more letters and more telephone calls, many of which sort of said, did you hear about my locking myself? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, no, actually I didn't, but it, it is a common affliction. But it, it was uh, very amazing because sometimes, you know, if the apartment above is empty and the sum in the apartment below, it's it's quite an extraordinary thing. Yeah, well, it and, was terrifying. Uh, Go ahead, please. Well, I thought uh, we were talking about, uh, I was talking to Kenneth Rexroth about po poetry. And he said, you know, writers are not very nice people. The trough is too small and there are too many pigs. <laughs> and, you know, there is, of course, a case to be made for that. But I haven't really found that in my own experience very much. I have not either. But this, uh, I have found it at times, and this is a, I won't say a tribute, this is a memo to one of the people that he was talking about. It's called Bird Song of the Lesser Poet. Exuding someone scotch in a moving mist, abstracted as he broods upon that grant, 
He has an intimate word for those who might assist. For a bad review, a memory to shame the elephant. Who would unearth a mine and fail to work it? His erstwhile hosts are good for fun and games that brighten the lumpen audience on the poetry circuit. He drops only the most unbreakable names. Disguised as youth, he can assign all guilt. His clothes proclaim a sort of permanent stasis with a hawk's eye for sign of professional wilt. He weaves his garden of friends on a monthly basis. And yet, and yet to that unattractive head, and yet, and yet to that careful, cagey face, comes now and again the true, terrible word, unearned, the brief visa into some state of grace. Well, it always amazes me when someone like that comes out with a beautiful poem. Well, but sometimes this, they do. It's a generous poem at, at the conclusion. I mean, to be as tough as it is about that type and to say, even so. It does happen. Yeah. It does happen always to my incred incredulity. Well, well it's, it's finally uh, <laughs> more generous than it is judgmental because it lets him it lets him into that company that he wants so much. Right, right. and it's, uh, I think, Mr. Rector, I have found that most of the best poets that I have known have also been the best people. I said that to John Broderick, and he said, all right, tell me some. So I told him some, and we went back and forth. Well, I feel that way, too. You know, R Robert Lowell said, uh, uh, he named someone, a friend of his, who said, poets aren't uh, competitive. Well, they mm -hmm. are, Lowell mm -hmm. said. Mm -hmm. But in fact, I haven't, I haven't found that to be true. And uh, th the poets I consider the best of those I've known personally have not been like that, have not been mean or competitive. No, I think you do run into it. I know when I was at the Library of Congress and we were dealing with all the invitations and all the people that came there, every now and then you would get someone whose ego was so, so obvious and so touchy that you thought, oh, this is going to make for a difficult evening. But not many. Right. Not many. Well, that's good, good to hear. I think so. Go ahead. You want, another, you want another poem? Well, uh, maybe I can ask you a question. I, I, I want to, I, I, people are going to want to hear you read poems and not hear me uh, chat. Um, uh, well, I can dispute that, but. Um, one of your critics compares your poems with those of Elizabeth Bishop and Mary Ann Moore and Louise Bogan. Uh, do you think of them as, uh, are they favorites of yours? Do you think of them as influences on you in any way? Well, you, <clears throat> you know, it's really curious, Roland, because uh, I do, Elizabeth Bishop is one of my very favorite poets, but I do not feel that she has been an influence on my work. I didn't get to know her work really for many, many, many years. And the strange thing is that the poets I admire most are not the poets that I feel have influenced my work, which is strange. I can't explain that. I mean, for instance, I think that as far as influences went, I think that Yeats and Auden were the people I can trace whose influence I can trace. Uh, on the other hand, uh, two poets that I think are wonderful poets, A.R. Ammons and Julia Randall, I don't think had any influence on it at all, and yet I admire them tremendously. So I don't think the poets you admire are necessarily uh, uh, the influence. Yes. There's huh. something that uh, maybe it's their technique or maybe it's what they're interested in that that really shocks you and, and takes over. And I felt that with Yeats when I was young and with Auden for many, many, many years. Yes. Huh. Well, thanks. Let's hear some more poems. All right. Uh, this is a poem called It Is the Season. It is the season when we learn or do not learn to say goodbye. The crone leaves that as green virgins open themselves to sun, creak at our feet, and all the farewells return to crowd the air. Say, Chinese lovers by a bridge with crows and a waterfall. He will cross the bridge, the crows fly. Children who told each other secrets and will not speak next summer. Some speech of parting mentions God, as in adieu, adios, commending what cannot be kept to permanence. There is nothing of north unknown as the dark comes earlier. The birds take their lives in their wings for the cruel trip. 
all farewells are rehearsals. Darling, the sun rose later today. Summer, summer was what we had. Say nothing yet. Prepare. I love the ending of that, beginning with Darling. All, all sad, farewells sad are rehearsals. Point. Is that yes. all? It reminds me of Retke's Many Arrivals Make Us Live. But, it, but there's also something uh, about that poem that suggests farewells in arrivals. Yes, I was thinking of all farewells. You know, the farewell to some of the farewell of people, the people that won't see each other again, like children who get so intimate and love each other, and then something they don't want to speak. Yes. Um, these break-offs that, that happen. Yes, they're terrible. They are, and uh, some of them are inexplicable, and some of them are just in our, in our lot. Uh, there was one poem I, I thought I would read, uh, which I'm very uh, dubious always about reading. You know, uh, misinterpretation of poems is something that all poets get used to. If that bothers you, you should try another trade. <laughs> but um, uh, an ironic poem is even more so. And uh, I was always a little nervous about this poem. And then Garrison Keillor read it on Ash Wednesday this year over national radio. And I had a real attack of thinking, I wonder how many people were shocked by that poem and interpreted it quite differently from what I meant. Well, it's very short. Uh, notes from a Lenten bar. I was at the Library of Congress, and I came in very, very tired, and I stopped to have a drink before I went up to my room, and it was quite a convivial scene. I know that my Redeemer liveth, because the pebble-eyed gent with the briefcase, two tables down, has called him by name three times in two and one-fourth minutes, <laughs> and because the guys on my right a liquid with the health of victorious immaculate conception, 46 to 98. And because, after the last of my supper, I learn once more, as I rise to 1403, there is nothing between the 12th and the 14th floor. <laughs> Isn't it curious how these things last, I mean, these tiny little trivia that are tossed off? But it's wonderful. I mean, it's uh, these men swearing at the bar. And... Oh, yes. <laughs> Immaculate Conception was so marvelous. Well, you know, Holy Cross did very well last year. <laughs> so it goes. Sports I mean, and uh, cursing. Cur sports. And the mystery of the 13th floor. And the mystery floor. of the 13th floor. And I bet most people don't associate <laughs> the, why they consider 13 an unlucky number. Do you think? No. I really don't think they do. <laughs> but, well, shall I read one more and then... Uh, well, I'd like, I wish you would talk a little bit more. Uh, this is a curious poem because it's very sad to me, and yet it's at the same time it's very uh, superficial in its setting. But uh, it's much more personal than most of the poems that, that I ever, ever read. But we'll just see. It's called uh, Survivor's Ballad. Well, where have I got it here? It's uh, two, 211. Two, 211, yes. I had it right here a minute ago. 211. Nothing like having your page numbers instead of having to search through. Survivor's Ballad. She's not sure if it's song or sermon. Ballad of a tight-knit trio. Graduates of the Monday German. Two with beauty and three with brio. Three were cocky and three were witty, two took a dim view of their local past or future, took both to New York City, but three times a year they lunched at the Astor, close as thieves in their favorite venue. The waiter welcomed his favorite trio, pink carnations and shiny menu, two with beauty and three with brio. That was long before the trouble. Trio, carnations, wine and waiter, the Hotel Astor has long been rubble. She doesn't know what was built there later. The beauties fought and made it up. But after that, it was so of qui peut, with more sharp cracks than a broken cup. And she ended with double lunches à deux. The dark-eyed one was put through paces by bitter pain before she went. The blue-eyed one lost names, then faces, then who she was and what she meant. 
song or sermon, poet or pastor, a dream revisits the last of the trio. Greedy and young at the Hotel Asta, two with beauty and three with brio. It's wonderful. I love the, I love the rhyming, the skillful I rhyming. I love ballads, and I wish I had done more of them. I've done very, very few, but they appeal to me tremendously. And, and you know, this, this, the blue-eyed one lost names, then faces, then who she was and what she meant, has a wonderful echo to me of Edwin Arlington Robinson, one of the poets I loved when I... Mr. Flood, or... Yes, that, mm -hmm. the, but that, that phrasing. Yes, yes. What she, what she was and who, who she was and Well, they were meant. two gorgeously beautiful women, contemporaries and friends of mine, and uh, it's a, to me it's a very, very sad point. Yeah. Well, it is. It also has that displacement, that forgetfulness, the loss of the room, or the identity by losing the room. But what about, uh, I, I'm delighted to see in these, uh, in the newer poems, um, rhyme. Uh, do you think it is making a comeback? Well, the new formalism. You know, I have never had any use for trends. I feel very, very strongly that trends in poetry are, are for the birds. I think every poem that a poet writes brings within it the seed of its own form, what it should be. And I know I can start a poem and just know it's all wrong and I have to throw it away or start over again. Because of and the form? Because of the form. It's not the right form for that poem. And I continued writing rhymed and formal poetry in the day when it was such a disadvantage that you felt a triumph when it was published. Now the new formalism, oh, I have at home, I think, five or six anthologies about the new formalism, you know. Now it's very important that you should have formal poems and even perhaps rhymed poems. Well, I just think that's absolutely ridiculous. I wrote both kinds when only one kind was fashionable, and I have no idea now of going back necessarily to, I wrote this because I love the ballad form, but certainly not because, uh, have you read, um, let me see, what some of the, uh, A Formal Feeling Comes? That's one of the better uh, yes. anthologies. No, I have not read that anthology. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, and, and there are at least five or six that I have uh, that are saying, oh, now this is, the way poetry should be written, and I just don't approve of that. Do you? No, I don't. And I, I, the poems I read in closed forms and rhyme now, I find very often don't do what uh, Auden and Yeats could do, and Josephine Jacobson can do. Ah. I mean it. They, I mean, they, they, uh, they've counted their syllables mm -hmm. and they rhyme, but um, they don't have the, what the urgency, or it doesn't have the feeling of an imperative, that form. Right, and if you get a feeling of cramp, of inevitability, I mean, that just destroys the poem. I just think you have to try to find out what form this poem wants. I really believe that. Good, I'm happy to hear it. Well, I'm happy because that you're happy. Because I, I, I do. I mean, I'm, I'm still occasionally writing poems with uh, those traditional forms, but, I, but the other kind as well. And... Uh, um, I think it's very important that the poet, when he sits down to write, or she sits down to write, uh, should not feel, now, I must remember that whatever I want to say has got to go into this form to be acceptable, and that, that is just deadly. I think so, too. I'm sitting down and pouring it into the form. Yes. You know, so. No, it just... Well, we have uh, time for about three or four more poems. Are you sure? Well, yes. Fine. I'll read a, <clears throat> a poem called Softly. Um, this was, I've been always interested in archaeology very much and have written a number of poems about it. My father was an amateur archaeologist. He was a doctor. He was a physician. But uh, he did a good bit of excavation and was very interested in it. And I've always found it absolutely fascinating. And uh, the fact that when we walk over the ground, wherever we are, I mean, Below us lie city after city, hundreds, thousands of people that have lived and died there. It's a, well, this poem, I try to say it softly. Wherever we walk, we walk over the silent. Cities we know or never heard of, whose citizens gave themselves in sleep to dreams not understood, saw how far the stars were how the moon shrank and went. Dust to dust they coupled, joined dust they found precious, lit fires for cold and dark, lost what they could not keep. 
walk softly over the dust of their cities, deep below, over the places that were dear to them or bitter, under the pasture, the forest, the ugly street, the museum that houses their artifacts, in respect of that fraternity. Over its numbers, see how few move. It's wonderful. That overwhelming feeling of the, the, the small number of the living compared yes. to the... Um, it made me think of two things when I reread that poem. I was in Perugia in Italy a few years ago, and there is an Etruscan well that was discovered. But they had to excavate 450 meters to get down to the top of it. I don't doubt of it. Of this well. And think of all the generations that passed along that way. It's, it's a fascinating thought. And even, I mean, in the most mundane places, when they do dig, they do find relics yes. of the people that have been before them. And uh, in Catch-22, uh, Yosarian finds out that someone has died, and he says, he joined the majority. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> That's what the two things that poem made me think of. Well, I think we've uh, come to a time to hear your um, gentle reader poem. Fine. Uh, that will terminate. 140, that is. Let me see here. Uh, this was a poem that um, I am very, very fond of. I mean, I'm not too fond of a lot of my poems because it's always something that got away, you know, that I didn't do. But uh, This is one of my favorites, too. Well, I had been doing a lot of reviewing, and I had been reading a lot of just awful poetry. And I think I was in a little bit of a tantrum when I wrote this. And then I was reading some superb poetry. And you always want to say something about that, and nobody has ever said it satisfactorily. I suppose Marlowe came closest to it, but nobody, I think, has ever described what the reading of a great poem is. So well, this is my own attempt. Gentle reader. Late in the night, when I should be asleep, under the city stars, in a small room, I read a poet. A poet, not a versifier, not a hot shot ethic monger laying about him, not a diary of lying about in cruel, cruel beds crying. A poet, dangerous and steep. Oh, God, it peels me, juices me like a press. This poetry drinks me, eats me, gut and marrow, until I exist in its jest of sorrow, until my juices feed a savage sight that runs along the lines bright as beasts' eyes. The rubble splays to dust, city, book, bed, leaving my ears lust, saying like Molly, yes, 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 oh yes. Ah, oh, that's wonderful. And I recall so, vividly, yeah, recall so vividly uh, Molly and Ulysses and her great longing and acceptance. So it's I been don't. A, excuse me. No. It's been a great pleasure talking with you, Josephine, and hearing you. Well, and it's always poems. good to see you, and, and this is very special. Well, it's special to me, I'll tell you that. And, and I'm so glad uh, you were able to come and read from this wonderful new book for us, In the Crevice of Time. Well, uh, you know, one is always in love with one's latest book for a while. <laughs> and so we're still in the honeymoon period, this book and I. <laughs> Happy honeymoon. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for joining us on The Writing Life. You know, Rona, I always wonder what the people are talking about. <laughs> Thank you.